Hello everybody and welcome to this my second of three videos on the Sony Alpha A5000. In the first video we talked about what all of the things on the camera are. In this video we're going to talk about what all of them do. And then in the third video we're going to go through the entire menu system and we're going to talk about what all of the menu items do and how it affects your photography. First thing we're going to do because this camera can't do anything at all without a battery is change the battery. The battery is under this battery door right here. To open it, you just slide it that way, pop the battery open, hit that blue tab, and now you can slide out the battery. As you can see, I have a third-party battery in here. This camera is battery efficient enough that third-party batteries work very well. It uses the Sony NP-FW50 battery, uh, and yeah, actually almost all my batteries are third parties. So when you take out the battery then to put the new battery back in you just do the reverse with this camera you can see the label here has a an electronic contact on the side of it that goes toward the back of the camera if you look down into the camera's chamber you can see right there are the electronic contacts for the batteries that's correctly loaded if you load it backwards let's see what happens because these are kind of the same shape you can load it but you can't push it in far enough to click it into place so if that happens, you just put it in the other direction. And there you go. One tip I have for you on the batteries, because even though, yes, it does sip batteries by alpha, by E-mount alpha standards, mirrorless cameras do generally drain batteries very quickly. So what I have is, I, I had at one point 20 batteries. I think I'm down to about 14, 13 or 14, because some of the older ones started to swell. Um, but what I also did was I invested in a double battery charger that can charge two batteries at once. And then I used some command strips to just stick it to the wall and run a uh, power cable down to an electrical socket. And then I can just charge two up at a time. And I'm pretty good about keeping all my batteries fully charged by doing that. Lens mounting and unmounting on this camera is really easy. Here we have the lens mounting release button. You just push it, turn counter or anti-clockwise, and now you can remove the lens. To remount the lens, you want to find the index on your lens. Some of them have it right here. That feels really weird. Yeah, that's pretty loose. Anyway, some of them have it here. Some, some third-party lenses have it under the mount. This, this index lines up with... almost can't see it because this camera's been used so much. But there's a white index mark right there next to the screw. You just line those two up turn clockwise until it clicks, and you've mounted a new lens. In order to record pictures with this camera, you're going to need a memory card. Those are on the side right here. The memory cards go into that slot right there. These can take SD or SDXC. This is an SDXC battery, or a SD card rather. And they can also take Memory Stick Pro and XC Duo cards. If you're interested in the complete list of memory cards that this camera can take, the manual on page 19 has that complete list. The maximum size for, of memory card for this camera is not stated in the manual. I personally used up to 64 gigabyte memory cards in this without issue. The SDXC standard, which this is supposed to be able to take, uh, it, it can take SDXC cards. I don't know if it takes them up to the full standard. The cap for the SDXC standard is two terabytes. Many of the older cameras that could take SDXC cards, however, could only take them up to one terabyte or 512 gigs. Like I said, I don't know what the maximum is with this, but with a 20 megapixel sensor, a 64 gigabyte card will last you a long time. To load your SD card, you just slide it. Nope, not like that like that, into the camera, and now you are ready to start recording images or video. When you are done with it, you want to transfer your files to your computer, push it in, it'll pop out slightly, and now you can go put the photos and video you took on your computer. For the camera's flash sync, it has only the ability to use the pop-up flash. The flash release button is right there, and when it pops up, now you can use your flash. This, the sync speed on this camera is 1 1 60th of a second. This flash is bright enough that if you have off-camera flashes that can be triggered by a flash and they're close, 
that this can also work for that. Now let's start taking a look at some of the buttons on the top and we'll talk about how each of them work. So here's the flash release which pops up the flash. It, it never gets old. It is so much fun to do that. Okay. This is the on off button. It powers the camera on and off. See if, all right, yeah, hey, look, you can see I'm wearing a plain white shirt. Okay. This is the zoom button, which you can see zooms the lens in and out. You can see my script and me. Hello, YouTube. Okay. So that's what that is for. That takes a photo. If I had a card, it would record it. I don't have a card so it doesn't record it. And this button right here starts recording movies. No memory card, it's not gonna let me do it, that's fine. On the screen here, we can see some different displays. We'll get to these in just a second, but the basic display, what we're looking at right now, tells you your shooting mode up here, manual, whether or not you have a card, your shutter speed, your aperture, your um, exposure, whether or not you are properly exposed, and your sensitivity. Okay, on the back of the camera, we have a bunch of different things. We have the screen, of course, which has some data up here, megapixels, video format that you can use Wi-Fi with this camera. Here's your menu button. And like I said, in video three, we're gonna go through all of this in detail, everything behind the menu button. This is your four-way control pad, display, self-timer, and drive mode, ISO, also called sensitivity, and exposure compensation, and then the OK button is the one in the middle. We're gonna start right here with drive mode because it's the easiest. By pushing the drive mode, button, drive mode button, it pulls up all of these different modes. That's single shot. Push the shutter button and you can hold it down as long as you want, it will never take a photo. But if you keep pushing the shutter button over and over again, it'll keep taking photos. Continuous shooting will keep taking photos as long as you hold the shutter button down. Speed priority continuous shooting will do the same thing, but faster. So that's continuous shooting. That's speed priority continuous shooting. Self timer, you can set it to 10 or two seconds. Continuous self timer, you can set this to three seconds or five seconds. And what that's gonna do is start the self timer countdown. There's a little red light though. I don't think you can see it on the camera. And then, I'm sorry, three or not three or five seconds, three or five frames, I misspoke. C3 means three frames, C5 means five frames. So it counts down the self timer and then it takes multiple shots. Bracketing continuous is uh, doing the same basic thing, but with exposure bracketing. With this self timer, it takes three identical shots. With this, it takes multiple shots in uh, with different exposure settings. So you could do something like HDR or bracket to make sure you get a proper exposure. You have a third of an exposure value, a third of a stop, two thirds of a stop, full stop, two, three, and then back to a third of a stop. So you could see that when I took that photo, all I did was press the shutter button and it took multiple shots, one at the proper exposure and one that was a third of a stop at a different setting. So that's how the bracketing mode works. And bracketing continuous, by the way, let's uh, go back to this. I'm gonna hold the shutter button down. And so you could hear that as long as I held the shutter button down, it kept taking shots. And when it went through the whole bracketing sequence, it stopped. I'll do that again. So it took three shots, each at a different exposure value, as long as I held the shutter button down. Bracketing single, looks like a bracketing single, should be one shot per button. And you can see it has the exact same bracketing pattern as the continuous. And that is how bracketing single works. It allows you to take photos when you want to, not just immediately in quick succession. Bracketing white balance allows you to take different photo, uh, a series of photos with different white balance settings. 
DRO bracketing is dynamic range bracketing. Honestly, white balance and DRO bracketing I have never once used. Generally speaking, one of the big advantages of shooting with a camera is that you can shoot raw and edit high quality raw files. White balance can be adjusted in raw very easily just by adjusting color temperature. So there's no real benefit to using a white balance bracket if you're shooting raw. Same thing with DRO. Everything that these do really only apply to JPEG only shooters. If you're shooting raw, these provide you no benefit whatsoever. So we'll go back up here to the main and the most important drive modes and we're back at the beginning. All right, so next we're gonna go over here to ISO because this is the next easiest to understand and we're gonna push that. And now we just scroll or use the click button, however you're most comfortable with, with whichever kind of Sony user you are to scroll through your different ISOs. And you can see mine are done in third stop increments. And we go all the way from 100 on the slow end or auto if you want to do that up to 16,000. So you can select auto to have the camera tell you what the best ISO is, or you can tell the camera what you think the best ISO is. And you can see here with ISO auto that there's a range. The, right now the camera is telling me that it will select an ISO between 100 and 3200, no more, no less. If I hit the left button, now I can come over here and adjust the low end of the ISO settings hit the left button, or hit the right button rather, again, and now I can adjust the high end of the ISO settings. So that allows you to customize your automatic ISO range. So for instance, if you wanted to say, keep this at a pretty small range of 100 to 400, and then have manual exposure settings, you have a little bit of forgiveness in your manual exposure settings because of your ISO compensation, or uh, ISO, automatic ISO setting from the uh, camera. I'm going to leave it in 100 ISO, however. Next down here, we have the exposure compensation button. So in any of the automatic modes, which is anything that's not manual or where exposure compensation is not uh, disabled, you can see down here, there's this little icon. That's your exposure compensation icon. And right now, plus and minus zero means the camera in this automatic mode that we have it set in will give us a proper exposure but if we hit the exposure compensation button, now we can use the, the wheel or the click button to go back and forth from up to three stops to under three stops. So more light, less light. So let's say, for example, if you're familiar at all with uh, camera settings, that F5.6 and 1 1 25th of a second is a proper exposure. If we go over here, your camera is either going to give you f4 or 1 60th of a second, or f2.8 or 1 30th, or f2 or 1 15th. So what's going to happen here is that as you go over this direction, the camera is going to give you more light. And if you go over this direction, it's going to give you less light. So this allows you to, to adjust your exposure so that you can either get a slightly faster shutter speed than you should and correct the exposure in RAW in post, or so that you can intentionally take high key and low key photos or any of a number of other really good reasons. You could also, if you wanted to, do this setting to take an HDR sequence, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nineteen 10, 19 images long, up to. So this gives you some some exposure control if you're doing an automatic mode and still want to do an HDR at home. Now we're going to go up here to the, to the display button because the display button has the most in-depth stuff of these control pad buttons. As you hit the display button and scroll through it, you're going to get all of these different displays. There's four different ones and I forget if there are only four or if I only have four enabled. We'll see that in video three regardless. This is the basic display. Right now it's telling me I have no card. If I had a card, it would either be blank there or it would tell me how many photos are left. Let's find out because I don't remember which one that does. There we go. So it's reading the card. Okay, so it's blank telling me that, not gonna tell me how many photos I have. But if I pop into a menu and back out, oh, still not gonna do it, okay. Manual mode up here. The M tells me I'm in manual battery charge and indicator at a glance. These things of course disappear after a couple of seconds. Shutter speed 
If you're using an automatic mode, it will tell you which shutter speed the camera has selected, not which one you've selected. Your aperture, if you're using a lens that the camera can read the aperture from. Your exposure compensation, in manual mode, it will tell you how far off you are of a proper exposure. And your sensitivity. Another thing that this has, I have enabled, you might be able to see or not, the grid lines for, there we go, there you can see it, the grid lines on the screen. We'll talk about those and how to turn them on in video three, but if you turn them on, they will help you get level horizons and vertical verticals. Grid lines are very helpful for good photos. Hit display, and now we have this display, which is the same thing, but it adds your histogram over here. So you can see in real time the histogram of your image. And if you want to make sure that you don't clip your highlights or shadows, this can be a really useful tool. Most people come to a point where they realize that this does, they don't need this anymore, but when you're learning how to, how to start off with a camera and how to start off especially with digital photography, that can be very useful. Next here on this display, we have a whole lot more information. Here's your memory card information telling you how many photos are left on this memory card. 32 gig memory card in there and I have 4,055 photos. Aspect ratio, megapixels, whether or not shake reduction is turned on, it is off for me. Your resolution, fine. Your video recording, 60i, is that right? Is that what that is? Looks like it. 60i would be the frame rate, rather. FX is, what is FX? That's a video setting, and I am not familiar enough with the video to remember exactly what that does, because this only has 1080p, it doesn't do a whole lot for me for video. NFC, battery, and then the same info down here. Now this right here is your um, manual shutter control. So if I rotate this dial right now, in manual mode, this will now allow me to adjust the shutter speed. But what if I want to adjust the aperture? Oops, let's get back to that. What if I want to adjust the aperture? If I hit the down button, oh, back into, so TV means I'm adjusting the time of my exposure. AV should mean I'm adjusting the aperture, but it's not letting me because I don't have an aperture of a coupled lens on the front. If I had the stock Sony lens on, now that that says AV, I could rotate this dial and it would adjust the aperture for me. Okay, so this is what's in this display right here. This next one has some, uh, has basically your uh, similar, well, has different information, but it provides mode and setting information. So we have all of the same stuff up here and down here. Shooting mode is single frame, manual focus, or it would tell you, tell you autofocus if you had that. This is your metering mode. This is face detection is off. I'm not sure what that setting is, but it's off, so I must not need it. This is your metering mode. This is your, this is your focus confirmation mode over here. So this tells you which type of focus confirmation or autofocus you're using. This tells you how you're metering your scene. This right here, what you're seeing is full matrix metering. White balance setting is auto white balance. If you're using a different white balance, it would reflect that here. DR is dynamic range or HDR light. It's off as it should be. Standard plus zero plus plus or minus zero plus or minus zero. Now that is, uh, these are settings for your image toning. So basically you could apply some, some filters and tonings in this camera. We'll see those later, I think in this video. If not this video, then video three. They can adjust the way that your images look. I think they only apply to JPEGs, not to RAW. But honestly, uh, you can do way more than this camera can do on your computer with any number of free programs. So I would recommend always leaving these to off because you can always add filters and coloration later. It's very hard to remove them. Now the OK button here is context sensitive. If you're in something like a menu or a playback, it works as the OK button. I have it set, and we'll see in the third video how to do this, to be manual focus zoom. So when I hit it once, it brings up this orange box. And let's see if I can show you. If I hit it a second time, uh, there we go. 
it zooms in. It's kind of hard to see, but the zoom, you can see what's on this screen right now, is what's in that orange box. And I can move around if I want to. You can't really see it, but let's try this. Yeah, I still can't really see it. Um, but by moving the control pad, now I can move what's zoomed in. And I can zoom in even further, and then back to full zoom, uh, full, full outward zoom. So one of the nice things about that feature is if you use a lot of manual focus lenses, you can zoom into exactly what you want to have be in focus in the photo. So we can zoom in, zoom in, and we're going to do our focus. Okay, great. And then take your photo while you have focus confirmed, and that will give you uh, very, very precise focus with your manual focus lenses. If you're using manual focus lenses, that is how you want to have this button set. It's very useful. Next button is the play button. This will open up the uh, memory card to show you the photos that you have taken. Over here is the question mark, which is the help button, also the delete button. So you can delete button your photos. Now, if we... I believe, and we'll see this for sure in the third video, that there is a menu option to determine whether you start on delete or cancel. Starting on cancel is preferable because if you accidentally hit OK when you're on delete, you can't get the photo back. But if you accidentally hit OK on cancel and meant to delete, you can always go back in and delete it uh, on your second try. Now, if you hit play and you have no cards, no photos on the memory card, you can pull up some different settings. This is a calendar. That's the playback. This is your video playback, and that's your vi other video, MP4 versus AVCHD video playback, depending on what type of videos you're saving on your camera. All right, so before we go into the third video, we're going to do one thing in the menu, and that's the shoot modes right here. So the shooting modes are going to control the manner in which you interface with your camera's exposure. So if we hit menu and then we hit the OK button, that's going to take us into this display. And we can turn the wheel here and it's going to take us around all the different shooting modes and give us a little description of what they are. We're going to start here with P, Program Auto. Automatically sets the aperture and shutter speed. So with the lens I'm using right now, which is a manual focus aperture uh, lens with no aperture linkage to the camera, this will not work, but if you have, say, the stock 16 to 50 millimeter lens here, this will work just fine. When you use this mode, what the camera is going to do is say, okay, I'm looking at this scene, and I'm going to pick the best shutter speed and aperture based on what I think the photographer is trying to do, and then it's going to take that photo. Next, we're going to... wrong way. I always get turned around by which way to turn this dial. Next, we're going to go to the A, which is Aperture Priority. This is the, the mode that I find, personally, I find most usable. What you do is you set the aperture, and then the camera is going to pick the best shutter speed for you. So with a lot of the manual focus lenses like I use, the aperture doesn't communicate with the camera. So if you set it to Aperture Priority mode with one of those lenses, you just set the aperture and then the camera will figure out the rest once you focus and take the photo. So this is a very easy, semi-automatic way to use your camera. Just pick the aperture and forget. Next, we're going to go to S, which is shutter priority. Now, this will not work with the manual focus lenses that don't have an aperture contact, but it will work with any of the Sony lenses. What this does is this says you're going to pick the, fa the best shutter speed that you want, and the camera will then pick the aperture that it needs to get a proper exposure. So if you were to pick a thousandth of a second because you want to freeze some motion, then the camera will pick f2.8 to get the best exposure. If you have, in any of these, if you have your ISO in auto mode, then it will also pick the best ISO for you. In manual mode, you control the aperture and the shutter speed. The camera will tell you whether or you have too much or too little light, but it will do what you tell it to regardless. 
Now, if you do again have your ISO set to auto, you get a little bit of flexibility there, but manual exposure is where you control everything. Now, the next one here is your movie mode. The movie mode also has, if it's gonna, here we go, if we click OK, now we can pick four different movie modes. P, A, S, and M. Do you remember the uh, four letters that we just looked at previously for the still modes? They apply and work in the exact same manner for movie mode with this camera. So you can pick which one of those you would like. And then you can manually or semi-automatically or fully automatically have the camera uh, control the exposure settings for your movie. This next one is Sweep Panorama. So Sweep Panorama, basically if you've done any kind of cell phone photography since 2019, maybe even earlier than that, you're probably used to panorama mode where you hold your phone up and then you sweep it across a scene and you get a long skinny image. This is the exact same thing as that. So the best tip I've got for you on this is to hold the camera in the opposite direction that your panorama will be oriented in. If you're gonna take a landscape panorama, hold the camera in portrait orientation. That will give you a taller image with a little bit more scene in it. If you're gonna take an, a panorama that has a, um, a portrait orientation, hold the camera in landscape orientation and, and sweep that way because that's gonna give you a uh, wider portrait orientation panorama. When you're actually doing this, you use the control wheel, by the way, to adjust which direction you, the panorama um, will be oriented. There are a couple of notes with stitching panoramas with this camera. Uh, I believe this comes straight from the manual. Since several images are stitched together, the, stitch, the stitched part may not be recorded smoothly in some cases. The images may be blurred in, a dark, in dark scenes. When a light source such as fluorescent light flickers, the brightness and color of a stitched image may not be consistent. When the whole angle of panoramic shooting and the AEAF locked angle are very different in brightness and focus, the shooting may not be successful. If this happens, change AEAF locked angle and shoot again. AE is automatic exposure, AF is automatic focus. Basically what that's telling you is that if you use program mode and autofocus with your camera, the panorama might not work. The following situations are not suited for a sweep panorama. Moving subjects, close subjects, subjects with repeating patterns, like the sky, a beach, a lawn, fabric. Subjects with constant change, such as waves or waterfalls. Subjects with brightness, wildly different from their surroundings, such as the sun or a light bulb. The sweep panorama, the sweep panorama shooting may be interrupted in the following situations. When the camera is panned too fast or too slow, or when the subject is too blurry. Sweep panorama is kind of a pain to use with this camera, especially if you are spoiled and have a newer cell phone that can do that, where it's much easier. So if you are gonna be doing panoramas, one thing I would strongly suggest is getting a free software for your computer, just taking a bunch of overlapping photos and then manually stitching them together in your computer. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna talk about are the scene modes with this camera, and that's SCN right here. We're gonna pick OK, and now we can scroll through all of these different scene modes, and there are a boatload of them. Okay, so the scene modes, a couple of things. What they do is they allow you to specify a type of scene, such as a portrait or sports or macro, and then the camera, based on your input here, will pick the best settings for that scene. For those of you who have picked up this camera in an effort to become a better photographer and uh, start learning about how cameras work and doing this, picking this one because it was inexpensive, it's a big reason that a lot of people buy this camera. Avoid the scene modes. What the scene modes do is they take away the opportunity for you to learn how different settings affect your photos because they do all of the thinking for you about specific settings, you don't get that opportunity. 
So if you want to make the most of this camera and you want it to give you the best ability that it can to improve your photography, stay out of this menu entirely. That said, we're still going to go through everything and talk about what they are. All right, portrait mode. This emphasizes the subject and blurs the background. This works best if the subject is kind of close to you, let's say about five to six feet away, maybe less, and there's a background that's a decent amount behind them, say 20 feet or more. That's gonna give you the best subject isolation and blurry background. Sports action. What this does is this fires the shutter at a fast shutter speed and it should also disable the flash. Generally, this setting disables flashes in cameras. Macro works best at your lens's long focus points. So let's say you have a, a zoom lens, like the 16 to 50. The macro will work best at the 50 millimeter focal length. It works to take close-up shots, and it should generally also disable the flash. One thing to note is that Whatever the minimum focus distance on your lens is, this doesn't change that. So if your lens will only focus as close as three feet or however far away the minimum focus on this lens is, I forget, this doesn't affect that at all. That's built into the lens's physics. Landscape mode works best at the lens's wide end. That's if you're having a zoom. It works best at the, the wide angle setting. And it gives you a deep depth of field with rich colors, it will also give you a slightly slower shutter speed because it's going to use a small aperture. Sunset is designed to capture the most dramatic sunsets and sunrises by, ampli by amplifying the warm tones in your photos. Night scene you is su it's suggested for night scene that you use a tripod because it's going to give you better results. What this does is it takes long exposures to capture things like city lights, but also takes a short enough exposure to keep your skies dark at night. So a tripod is recommended because the exposure might be a half a second or two seconds, something like that, which is longer than you can hand hold it and not get image shake. Handheld twilight. This is like the night scene, but for handheld use. Basically, a bur from, according to the manual, a burst of shots are taken and image processing is applied to reduce subject blur, camera shake, and noise. This takes four images in sequence, and then it stacks them and eliminates blurriness to try to give you the best image that it can. Night Portrait. This uses the flash to automatically illuminate a person while also giving you a long exposure that captures lights and details in the background. So this would be, for instance, if you're, say, looking at a city from a couple of miles away, and the buildings are lit up because it's night, and you want to have your friend or whomever stand in front of the camera and have their portrait taken in front of the city. This is that mode. It will fire the flash to capture the photo of your friend, and then still have a long exposure so that the lights from the city show up in the photo. Also, by the way, for this one, a tripod is recommended because of the long exposure time. Anti-motion blur. This mode, according to the manual, allows you to shoot indoors without using a flash and reduces subject blur. The camera shoots burst images and combines them to create the image, reducing subject blur and noise. I believe this also takes four frames, but I don't have that specifically in my notes. The manual goes on to say that reducing blur is less effective in handheld twilight or anti-motion blur when shooting the following subjects. Moving subjects, close subjects, or subjects with continuously similar patterns such as the sky, a beach, or a lawn. Subjects with constant change such as waves and waterfalls. In the case of both handheld or anti-motion blur, block noise may occur when using a light source that flickers, such as fluorescent lighting. I'm just going to go back to uh, hit menu to get back out of the scene modes. Now that we understand those, we can go on and never touch them again. Okay, intelligent auto. That is the green camera with the, the letter I. In intelligent auto, 
the camera controls the shutter, aperture, and sensitivity, or ISO, whatever you prefer to call it. And what it does is it uses the scene detection capabilities that we just went over, built into the camera, to identify what type of scene, like we just looked at, is in front of the camera, and then select the best settings that the camera has available based on that scene. So for instance, if the camera sees a face, it's going to select portrait mode. If it sees a bright sky in a dark foreground, it will choose landscape. Superior Auto has the camera with the plus and the eye in yellow. So according to Sony's website, because it wasn't in the manual what this does, at least not that I could find, Superior, in, superior, in the Superior Auto mode, the camera automatically detects various scenes and executes the appropriate step for each scene to record a higher quality image. In normal scenes, it does this by recognizing the scene and the conditions such as the movement of the user, and the camera automatically adjusts to the best setting for the scene or condition to shoot a higher quality image. In low light scenes, the camera continuously shoots up to six images with high speed and accurate image processing then combines the images to create one noise reduced image. In backlit scenes, the camera combines three images that were shot continuously at different exposures and minimizes overexposure and underexposure to create a natural finish. Uh, also of note that generally speaking, this mode should be used with a tripod for best results when it's taking multiple photos. So basically, this takes what we just covered and amplifies it a little bit to move beyond just picking the best scene to the best overall mode in general. So, again, the best advice I have for you regarding shooting with this camera, especially if you want to become a better photographer, is use P, A, S, or M, and generally speaking, limit yourself to A, S, and M. That's going to teach you the most about how cameras and photography work, and the most about how to get really, really good images with the gear that you have. Now that we have gone over everything there is to do with this camera, all right, taking a photo with this camera is really simple. What you're, first, what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into menu. You don't have to do this every time, just the first time. I'm gonna go into menu here, and that's uh, not menu. Yeah, it is. Here we go. We're gonna make sure that your shooting mode is the one that you wanna use. So I wanna use full manual for this, or I wanna use aperture priority, or one of the scene modes, whatever it is you wanna do. Just make sure that you're set to the correct mode. Okay, I'm in full manual. Oops, wrong way. There we go. That's a proper exposure. No, that's dark again. All right, that's fine. That looks that looks fine. Okay. Anyway, so I've dialed in my settings if I need to. If you're using aperture priority or shutter priority, you only have to dial in the one of those that you want. Now you can zoom in or zoom out as appropriate for your photo. And when you're ready, you just take a photo. If you have an autofocus lens, it will focus for you. If you have autofocus, oh, that's a zoom. It's not focus override. But uh, at any rate, if you have an autofocus lens, it will focus for you and take the picture wherever it is uh, going to take the photo. And that's it. I mean, it is really a very, very simple camera to use and take photos with because it's designed to be very simple to use and take photos with. So that is my second video on this, the Sony Alpha 5000. In the third video, we're going to go through everything in this button back here, the menu button, and we're going to cover every single item in every single menu and every single tab. See you then. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, 
Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera. <laughs>